As the costs of fertiliser and of seed and of fuel rises, and also the number of droughts and, and difficult seasons increase, we really need to be taking advantage of all of the types of grasses that we have available. Native grasses are a fantastic opportunity and, and many people are not taking full advantage. They are more suited to the soil types, particularly acid soils. They require uh, little or no fertiliser, so they're much cheaper from a production point of view and they're more drought tolerant. The native grasses will hang on where some of our introduced pasture species won't. A number of the native grass species will stay green all year round and so when you have that little bit of summer rainfall they will just sparkle up and provide some valuable feed. Generally they've got a good feed value and high protein and good digestibility. So farmers are looking at their native grasses with new eyes. How they manage them they can either run them down or build them up and part of that is grazing and also the interest of this project is fire. Our indigenous traditional owners knew how to manage their grasses and how to make the most of it. These grasses have adapted to these soils and to Australian conditions. If you want farmers to adopt a particular practice, you have to give them a good reason why. Where are the numbers? With the trials, we've got four treatments, burnt, unburnt, grazed and ungrazed. And we've compared three different properties. So one has sheep, one has beef, and the other has neither. It's just uh, a trust for nature and it's grazed by kangaroos. I'm hoping lots of things, that we see what actually happens to our piece of land, that we perhaps you know, increase the knowledge of what the burning regime may have been here before this was ever colonised and maybe improve the quality of our little bit of land. We may be able to have the capacity to actually undertake a slow burn ourselves. I think it's, it's a matter of learning when the right time is to do the burn and then how that's going to affect your um, grazing management. I'm doing it because I've been a long time a believer in changing um, pasture species by burning. I've been, I used to burn the roadsides years ago and there was mainly paspalum and uh, what I found is that when I burnt it I ended up with kangaroo grass but I also reckon I've got a lot to learn. Trying to help you build extra value for your property you know. Yeah, yeah. You feel good about it then in the long run. Yeah. Nice real estate you know, good yeah. property, good dirt, good soil. Yeah. People are I think pleased to he see that that something like this is happening because I think Anybody who's a good observer of their own, and most farmers are, um, knows that there's a heck of a lot to learn from people who've done a lot of observing. So I, th I think, speaking for myself anyway, I'm interested because I recognise that I've only been here for 30 years, which is not very long. And uh, yeah, other people have been around for many <laughs> millennia. Basically, we're getting evidence to understand whether burning and different grazing makes any difference to the number of native species, their nutrition value and the abundant species type. So this was burnt in May and now in October we're now doing leaf samples. We're sending them to a laboratory and they will analyse them in terms of protein, digestibility and general nutritional value. So the higher the protein, the higher the digestibility, the more palatable it is and the more energy that provides. The whole name of the game is to either grow meat or to grow wool and so the more energy in those grasses, the more weight the animal will put on. These were assessed in January 2014, 10 metres by 10 metres to see exactly what species were there. You need something to compare with to show whether your treatment has made a difference or not. Just trying to find everything that's here, um, but because this is done in spring, you're likely to find a few more than we did in summer. Because uh, summer certainly is good for grasses, but not so good for some other plants. The May burn wasn't as hot as we would have liked. You don't get rid of all this thick thatch, and uh, you don't 
kill the grass seeds. These annual grass seeds will be killed by the fire. All those annuals will dry off and cure very quickly. So by Christmas time, it'll just be brown and they don't do anything then until the following autumn. There's nothing wrong with that per se. In fact, it can be quite a nice complement to a pasture if you've got a range of different annuals and perennials together. You've got a very productive boom in the winter, and then as you get to summer, if you get summer rain, then you've got a productive boom from the perennials. One of the reasons they're good is because they're relatively deep-rooted compared to these ephemerals. Some pastoralists had only realised they had native grasses when a catastrophe hit them. Massive thunderstorm events after massive droughts, and if it had just been exotic grasses, the whole paddock sort of just washed away. So they hang onto the soil, you get higher infiltration of moisture and better use of rainfall. Whereas a parcel like this, where there's a lot of exotic grasses, in the middle of summer, that'll just bear out because it'll just get blown away and you'll just get these big scalded areas, especially if it's grazed. The reality is that, you know, a well-managed exotic pasture in the right place you know, you can't be matched in terms of the productive capacity. But there's very limited areas where that's possible. It's silly to, to throw money into those pastures, so you need to do something else. The native pasture, you spend less money and uh, you get a better return because you have less costs. But the thing is, the, the stocking capacity is not the same. And there are a lot of native grasses that don't have a very high value in terms of feed. And that's why we're concentrating on these two high value ones particularly weeping grass or microlina and wallaby grass. Microlina is a really good feed source, particularly on hill country or country with poorer soils. It's a, a common, very widespread indigenous perennial grass and it's a summer active one, so it will continue to grow over summer if there's good rains. And it has these characteristic sort of sparse foliage and then a very um, distinctive weeping inflorescence. And the other thing that's distinctive about microlina is the very top of the leaf there's a little pinch. Most of the blades seem to have that and it's a distinctive feature of this grass. The other really nice grass is wallaby grass. Here's a nice wallaby grass here. The shape and of the inflorescence and then what happens when it cures and dries out. So that, that's a nice contrast. As it's growing vigorously it looks green and fairly compact like that one and then as it dries out, as it gets closer to summer, then the uh, individual spikelets open up and dry out and all the little hairs on the individual flowers fluff up. That's just the same inflorescence but just a week or so earlier. And then, you know, in a week's time that one will be doing the same thing. And this is also a perennial tussock grass, winter spring growing grass. This was a patch, a little patch burn that was done a little bit later than the one in May. The one for the plots was done when it was quite it was a bit cool and a bit moist and the burn wasn't that hot. And so the burns that they did do here must have been a little bit more intense, a bit hotter, and they've had much more impact in terms of removing the litter. So there's not the thick thatch that you've got in these other places. And the other thing you can see that wherever the burn was more effective, the tussock has been burnt right back and is re-sprouting. This is the kangaroo grass. But also the weed, you can see the weed cover is much reduced. Um, so a lot of these weeds are annuals, or at least they're behaving like annuals here. And uh, so when you go through and burn them, um, or any germinants that started this year and any seed that was sitting in the top of the soil is consumed by the fire. Opens up the spaces in between the tussocks. So you've got um, bare exposed soil. And because there's quite a high cover of grass tussocks, perennial grass tussocks, there's no real risk of any serious soil erosion. So there's no real problem with that. So that when you do get a rain event, those spaces become ideal opportunities for the regeneration and recruitment of native plants in particular. Certainly the grasses will regenerate quite happily in those gaps. The only issue over time is that, that also the, the exotic grasses, which you can see very widespread here, will also recruit into those spaces. So some follow-up burning could well be in order. That's all the thatch from last year. All that stuff there is all the dead stuff that's not very useful from a pastoral perspective. That's litter, you know, which you need to keep it and incorporate into the soil, but you don't want it to dominate the actual above ground vegetation because it slows down the growth rate of this makes it less palatable. If you were managing this from a pastoral perspective just using stock you would keep the, the foliage and litter levels lower so that whenever you do get the rain it starts to grow vigorously and you don't have as much build up of litter. Amongst all the, the weeds which is the silver grass and the brome if you push that aside there you have uh, all the microlina coming up. That is palatable stock 
and so if you can get rid of that annual grass stock you can potentially boost the abundance of this microlina. It needs to be disturbed, it needs to be burnt regularly. And if you, if you get the timing right you can really get a great result. It's a, it's a powerful tool and it's very very underused. You know we've talked about traditional burning and, and trying to get fire back into the landscape for those reasons but the reality is the landscape is very different to what it used to be. You know no one can argue that that it's anything like what it used to be and that it that we can go back to that. So what we need to try and figure out is how to use traditional practices and modify them in a way that makes them relevant to the contemporary time. If you talk to Aboriginal people they often say you know culture is not something that's set in stone and something that happened a long time ago it's dynamic and it's it's ours and and we need to um, adapt it for the for the modern times and the modern situation so that, that's exactly what's needed. We need to combine traditional knowledge with modern knowledge to take advantage of the assets and, and not to ruin those assets, not to lose those assets. There's no single solution. Every property is different. So you need to understand what undesirable plants do I have? What good native grasses do I have? And what's the outcome that I want? So it's about spending that time looking and observing. And if you're not sure, there's some fantastic resources on the internet and there's also books. And ask someone in your land care group. There's often some people that are very good at identifying grasses. It's all about looking at your land, looking at the capability and understanding how you can maximise that for your potential.